Our last speaker, not only for today, but for, for the symposium, is Professor Mario Micolinsia. John Bowlby said uh, that life is best organized as a series of daring ventures from a secure base. I was lucky enough to have had several secure bases in my life, and I consider Mario one of them. So um, for me, he was not only my PhD uh, in, uh, supervisor, but also an internalized uh, secure figure. <laughs> so thank you for that. Mario is professor of psychology at the Bauch Ifcher School of Psychology of the Interdisciplinary Center Herzliya. He has published six books and over 400 journal articles and book chapters. He serves as a member of the editorial boards of several personality and social psychology journals and was formerly the editor of the Journal of Social and Personal Relationships. His main research interests are attachment theory, terror management theory, personality processes in interpersonal relationships, coping with stress and trauma, grief-related processes, and pro-social motives uh, and behaviors. Uh, he is a fellow of the Society for Personality and Social Psychology and the, Associ and the Association for Psychological Sciences. He received the Emet Prize in Social Sciences for his contribution to psychology and the Berchide Hetfield Award for Distinguished Mid-Career Achievement from the International Association for Relationship Research. Mario's talk today is titled Attachment, Caregiving, and Parenting. Please welcome Professor Mikolins. So thank you. Thank you, Orit, for inviting me. And um, thank you for all the guests coming to Israel. Uh, it's hard to speak the last one and in the mid-afternoon, so uh, everyone is cognitively deplete, but <laughs> we will try. What I will try to do in this, uh, we are going here, yes, uh, is to present a um, theoretical, a theoretical talk. It will be, it will not be about findings. It's only to show, trying to to discuss with you about implications of attachment theory for understanding parenthood and individual difference in parental sensitivity and responsiveness, and also trying to adopt what happened when adopting an attachment perspective for future research. And some of them we already operationalized in our studies, but some of them are very speculative ideas that I will share with you. So first I will present a brief overview of attachment theory. I Probably you hear from other people here, Steve is here, so, but uh, I will give you only a few minutes about attachment theory and specifically those topics that uh, it will provide me a good uh, place to relate, uh, to link with uh, caregiving and parenthood. Then I focus on what attachment theory can teach us about parenthood or what we can learn from attachment theory. And finally, I also want to deal about with what attachment theory does not teach us about parenthood and some issues that I think are not uh, under the scope of attachment theory but are really important issues that uh, when we should deal with uh, speaking about parenthood. Mm -hmm. So, a brief overview of attachment theory. So, Bolby, the theory was created by Bolby. Here, here you see the main books about um, attachment. I think the most important book is uh, the first one, the called Attachment, the 6982 edition, the second edition of the book. And I think the the second very important book is the 88 book of the secure base where he, he explained all the issue of uh, what is a secure base. So in one slide about attachment theory. Uh, for according to Bolby and according to our way of understanding attachment, so humans rely on attachment figures for protection, support, and health with emotion regulation. So. This is the default default of the brain. When you feel distress, you 
seek for support, you seek for proximity for spe from special figures. What we call attachment figures is not simple relationship partner, but those person or those figures can be also symbolic figures that provide some sort of comfort, support, and a secure base for growth and autonomy. The second issue is that this, this motif, this attachment, is part of what we call an attachment behavioral system. This is Bowlby notion in the first book of attachment that replaces the Freudian drive uh, construct. And this system, this behavioral system, is an evolved innate regulator of proximity that we are born with this predisposition to seek proximity, to seek for those special figures that can provide this kind of security. And when they provide security, so we calm, and then you can go for exploration. And so the, the system works in a very kibernetic way that uh, when, threat, when there is some sign of threat, the system is activated automatically drive the brain to seek for those sources of security. When those sources of security are found and threats abate, so the system is normally deactivated and other behavioral systems are activated because there is an interplay, and it's a very important issue here, it's an interplay between different behavioral systems or different predispositions that when the attachment system is activated, it takes the lead. It is the dominant and other systems are inhibited because the brain is searching for protection security. Only when the brain feels secure, when the fe feels calm, relaxed, and with the confidence that there is someone around us, and we are not alone in a hostile world, but we are together in a safe world, so we can then go and take other activities and give uh, to other systems uh, activated, like exploration, caregiving, play, etc., etc. This is those three uh, points are the normative universal components of the system, but this system is activated in in an interpersonal context. And so there are individual difference, differences due to the, those interpersonal contexts and the interactions that the infant has with the main caregiver or the main attachment figures. And those uh, individual differences and develop into different working models, what Bowlby called working models or mental representations of self and others, and at the end in different attachment orientations with more secure attachment representing a history of positive interactions where the system works smoothly and this predisposition to search for a source of security is met with another person who is a provider of security and more negative interactions that develop into some kind of worries, insecurities, doubts about uh, the goodwill of others and uh, my value and worthy of love. And, and then this kind of insecurity lead the infant, the organism, to try to cope not now with the original distress, but also with the lack of security, and then form different kind of reactions to insecurity in the form of avoidant and anxious attachment. And the last point here is what Bowlby uh, wrote about the from the cradle to the grave, that attachment, the attachment system is active throughout all the time from the cradle, and it's not only for infants, but also in adulthood, the attachment system is activated. It's not activated in running uh, toward my mother, but uh, in symbolic uh, in symbolic representations in cognitions in motives in inclinations and also in actual behavior in case of traumatic events and we can see the the actual search for an attachment figure in several places and times so attachment uh, 
and generated thousands of studies in infancy, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. It was summarized in the Handbook of Attachment. This is the third edition. And, um, and it's so rich field that if we can take attachment theory as a platform for other uh, behavioral system, especially for caregiving and parenthood, so it can be also very prolific and create more and more research in the area of uh, parenthood. Today, when we are speaking about attachment um, orientations, we are speaking of a, a two-dimensional space. We are not speaking more about patterns. We are speaking about a dimension of anxiety, dimension of avoidance. Here, we have a region of security and regions of insecurity of attachment. We can measure it with a self-report attachment measure that uh, Miri uh, told, uh, used in her studies the experience in close relationship uh, scale, that uh, tapping avoidance and anxiety. And uh, we need also to recognize that even if you measure an attachment orientation, we are not uh, referring that we have a single attachment orientation. It depends what you measure. Because if you measure at a attachment orientation as a personality trait or a trait-like measure, so you have you ask people what is your identity in close relationship, but you can tailor the questionnaire and ask what is our, your attachment in a specific relationship with your spouse, with your mother, with your friend. And so you can have different orientations depending on which uh, relationship you tap. And also you can tap more episodic and in the same relationship you can have different kind of interaction. And you can have memories of secure interactions with your spouse and uh, insecure interactions with your spouse. So you have a network, a very complex network of attachment representations, some more secure, some more insecure, of course with different accessibility and dominance, but you can then use priming uh, methods in order to catch a specific representation and make this representation salient in a given context and then see what's happened when security is enhanced or insecurity is enhanced in a specific context, especially we are using in, exp in laboratory, but you can also see in different contexts, for example, in psychotherapy or in other contexts. So we summarized in our book uh, about attachment in adulthood. This is the second edition uh, in 2016. And we summarized this in a model of attachment functioning, where I will explain in a, in a brief, it's only it's that if there are si sign of threat, so the attachment system is activated. If not, so you are busy with other activities. Then the next question is, is an attachment figure available? If yes, so we this go to an infusion of attachment security and a reactivation of other behavioral system, but with the confidence that you have a secure base. If not, you are going to the path of insecurity and deactivating or hyperactivating strategies. And we use these three simple proposition to describe the complex arrows and pluses and minus. If threaten a sick proximity, if an attachment figure is available and supportive, so relax, enjoy, be mindful, explore the world. And if attachment figure is unavailable, so either intensify efforts to achieve proximity or deactivate the attachment system, it was avoid proximity. This is also an important part of the, what we focus a lot of time in the broaden and build cycle of attachment security. What's happened in the case where you find this kind of security at a given moment in a specific uh, moment of distress so you that you are free at this moment to direct yourself to other behavioral systems and we also have some kind and we have knowledge about a uh, procedural knowledge not only declarative knowledge of attachment not only mental representation of self and others but also a secure script and the secure script that everyone has in, in one's mind is this kind, that it's a series of if-then propositions 
that we can follow and when we internalize this secure script so you don't need actually to go and search for support because if you are now distressed you know that you, there are people with you and then you can feel relief and then you it's you can calm yourself and continue to do things without actually searching for support because you have this script but in the avoidant person mind we know that they lack this part and they immediately deny the distress and return to activities and don't touch the distress and for the anxious person mind they <laughs> keep trapped in the search for support but without having the confidence of relief. So this is our, a few uh, points and I will go about this because I think Miri and perhaps uh, you hear from other lectures. So what uh, attachment teaches about parenting and grandparents also because I became one month early grandparent so I apply all those things <laughs> to grandparenthood and while, while hearing, uh, listening to Miri, I, I have the voice of uh, my, the, the wife of my son that speaking about he, her childbirth, it's okay. I will not tell which one. <laughs> uh, the first lesson is the construct of the behavioral system. Like, like uh, we have the construct of attachment behavioral system, so we can apply parenthood and research and deal with parenthood through the lens of a behavioral system, or what Bowlby will call, or we call, the caregiving behavioral system. And it's also it's a psychobiological system evolved through evolution with adaptive function, proximal goal, activating trigger, primary strategy, benefits, etc., etc. And then we can analyze parenthood through the lens of this behavioral system construct. For example, what is the adaptive function of the care caregiving system? According to Bowlby, human beings are born with the capacity to provide protection and support to others who are either chronically dependent or temporarily in need. These behaviors are organized in the caregiving behavioral system that emerge over evolution because it improves the inclusive fitness of humans by augmenting the likelihood that children will reach reproductive age and will succeed in producing and rearing their own offsprings. So it's the basis of compassion, sense, empathy, caregiving, and also parenting as the prototype, but not the only example of caregiving. It means that we are born with a predisposition to become parents. We are born with a predisposition to take care of other people, of other suffering. And so for me, it's a very optimistic and a very positive psychology, a way of dealing with parenthood. Because in every one of us has this organismic wisdom that we know to care for others and we are predisposed, predisposed to care for others and if we have problems or treating when we are treating parenting related transition challenges and problems we need to take into account this hopeful attitude that in every one even in the in the most problematic mind have this organismic wisdom and we need to discover we need to prime it we need to make it salient because it's there. It's like the attachment. When you <laughs> deal with attachment, so you know that even in the most disorganized mind, they have a high line of security. There is this faith in other people because the organismic force that trusts that we are not alone in an hostile world. But if this feeling of being alone in a hostile world it becomes part of our learning, of our history, but not from our organism. In the same way, we need to deal here with the parenthood. What are the proximal goals of parenthood of the caregiving system? It's designated to serve two major functions, meeting another person's needs for protection in times of danger of distress, what will Bowlby will call providing a safe haven, 
and supporting other exploration, autonomy, and growth, like Bowlby provision of a secure base for exploration. These are the two roles of parenthood. These are the two functions of an attachment figure, because to become a parent is to become an attachment figure for your children, and the child needs a safe haven and a secure base, not only a safe haven, because a safe haven is to relax, but for what? It's not relax in order to relax. It's relax in order to grow, in order to allow to other behavioral system, our organismic predispositions to be activated, learn, explore, take risk, become autonomous, etc., etc. And the function of parenting is to meet the child needs. In this way, so we have a complementarity between the child attachment system and the parent at the parent caregiving system. Because the goal of a care seeker attachment system is also the aim of his or her care providing caregiving system. And the complementary, complementarity of goals, safe haven in times of need, secure base for exploration, autonomy, and growth. And the triggers, because the system is triggered by, automatically triggered by some internal or external stimuli, are identical to the attachment system, but not related to the self, but to another person. In this, guy, this case, the child. Threats, danger, and challenges that thwart the child's sense of security. And what is implications for parenting? It's very important, because uh, there are some distorted views about what is attachment parenting. And I will tell. What is not attachment parenting? Because what is attachment parenting is to be responsive, to, be, to activate the caregiving system when there is a need. A need for safe haven, a need for a secure base. But when there is no need for safe haven and no need for secure base, that caregiving system in parents' mind should not be activated. What in... in popular uh, now literature, it's called attachment parenting. It's a aberration of what attachment implies here. Because attachment parenting demand parents to be all the time available and supportive and responsive to the child. To keep the child all the time close to you. Nothing to do with what we are speaking. Because you need, the child need to be close to you. You need to be available for your child only when the child needs you. The other times, he will sit in this way, don't want you. What are the primary strategy of the caregiving system? In, if the primary strategy of the attachment system is to seek support, the primary strategy of the caregiving is to provide support. And you need three or in inclinations, or three dispositions. One, it's availability, parents' willingness and ability to connect and get close to the needy child. Sensitivity, the parent' willingness and ability to reflect and mentalize on the needy child. And responsiveness, it's the parents' understanding, accepting, caring, regulating, redirecting, reappraising, coaching. So provide this platform to the child so that it meets the child attachment need for safe haven and secure base. And what are the benefits of the caregiving system? Because every behavioral system have a psychological benefit. The benefit of the attachment system is the sense of security, that you are not alone in a hostile world, but you are in a safe world that you can explore. For the needy child, the benefit is clear. It's the restoration of security, emotion regulation, consolidation of a secure base, and autonomous growth. But also for the parent, the caregiver. The Dalai Lama told us that for the care seeker, the care seeker benefits 100%, but the care provider, the caregiver, benefited 200%. In what it benefits? In positive affect? in this kind of self-efficacy and mastery. But I will th I think that, and it is one of the issues that 
did not receive a lot of research is the sense of generativity. What, what Ericsson will call that this is the achievement or the task of the major proportion of our life between age of 30 and age of 60. To, to have this sense of generativity. What is generativity? Generativity, in my mind, is to create, but to generate, but also to create a new generation. Yeah. To generate, to generate a new generation. And it's to become a parent. And a parent, and it's not only the actual parenting, but also to take role of parents in different positions in your work as a teacher, in your work as a supervisor, in uh, your work as a, a manager, in every place where you are producing with other people and you are taking the lead or in a hierarchy of people, so you are activating and reactivating this caregiving system and the reactivation of the system provides you this sense of generativity. And this sense of generativity produces what Sheldon probably told you about symbolic immortality and, uh, and a means for dealing with existential threats and the existential threats of meaningless and biological finitude. And also it provides you this sense of uh, meaning for yourself that you have created something new from yourself. But we know that we have individual differences, like in the attachment system, there are individual differences in the caregiving system functioning. And so we know that there are success in failure in providing safe haven and secure base. And these positive and negative experiences can be derived from intra-individual problems in the caregiver or parent at the availability, sensitivity, or responsiveness level. And we don't have a lot of research systematically tapping those different components of uh, those intra-individual problems. We have interactional patterns in the caregiver and recipient relationship that can create obstacles for sensitivity, for availability, sensitivity, or responsiveness. And of course, we have contextual influences that create and can create problems in the provision of support uh, in a caregiver-recipient relationship. But, but we believe it like using and applying attachment theory to the, caregiv to the caregiving system functioning, that if the, a person caregiving system develops under positive circumstances, that positive interactions of providing care then compassion, empathy, sensitivity, and responsibility become a common reaction to a child's needs. However, if the caregiving system does not develop under those positive circumstances because of different causes, so they can create problems in the parenting relationship. And how we can study those individual differences? I will provide now different hints some of them we already operationalize, some of them not. For example, we can, we can assess the internalized mental representations of caregiving experiences, and then ask about the working model of the self as a caregiver, the working models of the child as a recipient, and the working models of caregiving interactions. You can tailor at a trite lake uh, model, like how you see yourself as a caregiver, tailored to a specific relationship, parent, and more specific relation, parent to a specific child. We, for example, constructed in 2007 the mental representation of caregiving scale, tapping five different components of, um, of this mental representation, and you can tailor to specific uh, caregiving roles, like parenthood or to general caregiving. And this scale taps perceived ability to recognize other needs, perceived abilities to provide effective help, appraisal of others as worthy of help, 
egoistic motive for helping or more other-oriented altruistic motive for helping. We also can take from attachment theory the way we conceptualize the, those inner representations as a cognitive complex network of mental representations that include episode, episodic representation of specific interactions with a needy child or more relationships, specific representations, being a parent of a specific child or generic personality-like representation of the self as a parent or caregiver. And we can find different, different aspects and different uh, components in each of those levels. And when we have this kind of complex network of mental representation, so we can take the, the perspective that in every caregiver there are positive and negative representations of the self, other, and caregiving interactions. And even in the most problematic parent, one can find Iceland of generativity like Iceland's, Iceland's of security. Islands. Implications, we have also um, another implication of conceptualizing uh, this complex network is the issue of priming. What will happen if you will prime now and make salient a specific interaction with your child, like what we are doing in the laboratory, that priming a secure provider, priming the the, this kind of security and infuse the person with the sense of security. What will happen if you infuse a parent with a sense of generativity? How will you react to this? And we don't have these generativity priming studies and I will be happy if one will conduct them. And also, you can also uh, assess orientations of caregiving like attachment orientations using the same model of hyperactivation and deactivation of the system and then assess anxious hyperactivation of the caregiving or an avoidant deactivation of the system and also conceptualizing collapse of the system in disorganized caregiving. So you can use all the knowledge we have from attachment to understand and assess differences. Uh, and then you can use the framework that we propose, but then rewrote it in from a caregiving perspective. It will not be there are signs of threat, but there are my child is experiencing distress, is experiencing problem. If yes, so the caregiving system is activated. I am available for this uh, for this uh, child. I am sensitive, sensitive to him. I, I can support, I can soothe him. Yes, so generativity. And then you can return to other systems. If not, you will create a lot of worries and doubts about myself as a good parent or as a good caregiving. And then you can assess caregiving anxiety and caregiving avoidance. And this is what we constructed the caregiving system scale in 2010 when w with one scale tapping caregiving anxiety and you can have here examples of items and caregiving avoidance or deactivation scale measuring this detachment uh, and this taking distancing from parenting or caregiving roles. And then you can also try to construct and assess the generativity script. It's not only the secure base script. You can use what we learn from the secure base script to create a generativity script, like if my child is encountering an obstacle, then I will approach him. So you can redefine and then assess in parents' mind if this script is available and what parts of the script are missing in the parents' mind. So since I don't have time, the second lesson, I think that you receive a lot about how attachment influenced the caregiving system and hundreds, today hundreds of studies documented the effects 
of variations in parent chronic contextual attachment orientation on availability, sensitivity, responsiveness, parenting behavior, caregiving mental representations, caregiving orientations, and we have that more secure attached people are more available, more sensitive, more responsive parents, etc. more insecure are less, and I don't have, I will not uh, enter this, but we need to take into account, and this also under-researched, is the impact of the caregiving functioning on attachment security. And part of uh, Stephen's uh, work on, um, on attachment in uh, parenthood transition show in some of their funding, findings how experiences, parenting experiences, especially interactions with the spouse in the caregiving, situ in the parenting situation can have an impact on a person's attachment security. For example, can positive parenting experiences change parents' attachment orientations? Or can positive interaction with children or grandchildren reduce a person's attachment insecurities? My hint is yes, but you need to research. And the third lesson is what attachment theory does not tell us about parenting. First, the issue of conditional versus unconditional positive regard. Because if you take from an attachment perspective, you are feeling all the time that it's unconditional positive regard. It's acceptance, understanding, being sensitive what the child needs, and going reflect and mentalize the child needs. And so it should be unconditional. But, but, what are the role of parental boundaries, demands, expectations? I think that the caregiving system, it's not to be a mommy. It's not to be all the time, I'm here for you. I can also demand. This is what I, when I giving those talks to officers in the army, to managers, to teachers, I try to explain them that I, the role, the, the basic role as teachers, as officers, as managers, are, is to provide a secure base. Because after providing this kind of love and secure base, you can demand everything from the person. Then you can put boundaries. Then you can ask them to go to work with the confidence that you are for this person. And we need to better understand how it goes, this kind of, for one side, unconditional positive regard, with this side of demanding expectations and boundaries. Because this is the issue of love. When you feel loved, from the other person, demands, restrictions are interpreted as signs of caring, of love, that the person is caring for you and so is demanding to you. But we need to introduce more and more the issue of power in the caregiving recipient interaction. Because as Bolby treats uh, this issue is that when Bolby spoke about the attachment figure, he spoke about a stronger and wiser caregiver. Stronger. It occupies the powerful position. And there is a lot of abuse of power. And we need to understand more the boundaries between power in the relationship, in the caregiving relationship, that can create this safe haven and secure base, and one when abuse of power can maybe provide some kind of safe haven, but of course will, will not provide a secure base. And we don't have still a very good conceptualization of how power interplays with attachment. So, to end, I think that attachment theory and research provide good leads for fostering good enough parenting and enjoying the transition for parenthood and interactions with growing children. It also provides, I think, an overarching conceptualization of normative and individual aspects of parenting through the lens of the behavioral system construct. And I think it provides important hints about the interplay, the potential interplay of parenting with other behavioral systems 
not only attachment, but also with other systems like exploration, learning, growth, and the sexual system, etc. Thanks.